Hello, I'm Kieran Lynch and welcome to Overcast, the Chocolate Sheep Podcast. Each week, we'll bring latest insights, advice and technical updates for the sheep industry. In this week's episode, we're joined by Mark Dolan, a postgraduate student in Chocolate Sat and Ray, and Dr. Frank Campion to discuss some of the ongoing work examining the role of forage crops in storage and finishing systems. Mark discusses the crops they've sown this year, when they went in and the types of lambs he's finishing on them. Frank highlights the role these crops have in store and finishing systems. As carrying and finishing capacity of these crops is highly important, Mark and Frank describe the crop yield they achieved last year, their carrying capacity and how many lambs were finished off each crop. We discuss the grazing management, the use of temporary fences, and how the difficult weather last year had an impact on crop utilisation. We switch back to current events, where store lambs being purchased at the moment. Mark discusses the management of these lambs on arrival and the reasons they opted to fully shear them. Frank also offers some advice on getting these lambs acclimatised to the crops and the need to provide a rougher source for them. We finish up with Frank highlighting the need for those using this system to assess the potential of the crops sown on their own farms this year. We start off, however, with Mark giving us some background to his project. So I'm a second year uh, Wall Schol- Scholar student. Um, I'm doing a postgraduate study here in Chagasat and Rye, looking at um, finishing hillbred lambs at forage crops. So I'm doing this in conjunction with UCD, with Professor Tommy Boland and Frank Campion here in Athenry. And Mark, just for the benefit of our listeners who might be familiar with this, what kind of crops are you sowing? So there's uh, various different crops, Kieran. Um, we have the three uh, brassica forage crops, which is kale, forage rape, and a hybrid brassica, other known as Red Start. And then these then will be compared to a newly received sward and an uh, old permanent pasture sward. So we're looking at performance and the differences across the various crops. So they're going to benchmark the other crops. Frank, I might just bring you in at this point. Like, where does this fit into our systems? What's the role of it? Yes, I suppose, Kieran, this work came on the back of two things, I suppose. First of all, the previous store lamb work on that, right, which people are familiar with, where we looked at finishing these type lambs indoor on ad-lib concentrates in a very intensive system. I suppose this led on then from a lot of store land purchasers who were looking at alternative options, maybe of putting in a, a forage crop, maybe after a, a winter or cereal crop or a winter rice rape crop, that they could put in one of these crops and grow it and you know store lambs on it for the winter and finish them off it. I suppose the big interest probably came to around the time of the drought in 2018 when people looked at, you know, what are these crops? Some of these crops were put in very much as an answer to a problem that year. And there was very little information we were able to give about, you know, what performance could we expect how should we manage lambs on it? And, you know, what, what was the best way to tackle tackle using the crops? So that's kind of where, where it came from. And I suppose their the role, role at the minute is very much towards, a, you know, look at putting them in, as I said, after, after a cereal crop and purchasing store lambs in the autumn to go on to it for the, the autumn and winter period. Mark, just one of the key things at the moment for purchasers of these lambs, they need to work out, you know, how many lambs can this crop carry? How many lambs can it finish? From your first year's work, I know it's preliminary data and you're about to start the second season of it. But from that first year, you might give some indication of the yields you got on these crops and their potential for carrying lambs to finish. Yeah, so the carrying capacity of the crops, it's largely dependent on the yield, the yield of the crop. So from my first year's data, um, I have results. Kale, it harvested 5.5 tonne of dry matter per hectare, followed by the hybrid brassica, which was 6.1 tonne of dry matter per hectare, and the forage rape, which was the, the, the highest yield of the, the brassica treatments at 7.1 tonne dry matter per hectare. Like for, from what you said, Mark, is like you have a bit of variation in them crops. I'm assuming, Frank, like that ties very closely into what them crops can carry. And obviously, look, you have two different types of lambs on it. I'm sure you have different start mates. You might be able to give us some indication, like what kind of carrying capacity was on these and how many of those lambs were you able to finish? Yeah, so look, at it, as Mark said, there was a there was a good deal of variation in them. So I like, I suppose the easiest way to do it is if you look at the, the forage rape, which is the, was the highest yielding crop at seven tonnes, just over seven tonnes of dry matter per hectare. When we looked at that, we looked at the two different weight categories. So if we look at the lighter lambs, so those lambs were only 25 to 30 kilos of lambs to the crop. Only 30% of them were killed off the crop. Whereas if we look at the lambs where were 30 kilos plus going onto the crop, 80 over just over 80% of them were killed off the crop. And then within that, we saw a big difference between the breeds. So you talk again about the lighter lambs, so those kind of 25 to 30 kilo lambs at the first week of October start on the crops. You know, so only 25% of them that were Scottish black faces made it off the crop. You know, so the majority of that 30% that were killed in the lighter weight 
were crossbreds. And it was the same when we looked at the heavier weights again. So when we looked at the lambs that were 30 kilos plus starting, you know, nearly 70% of the lambs that were killed were, were of the cro- were, Sc- were crossbreds. So they were, you know, your Texan cross Scottish blackface type lamb. So I suppose the big message just coming out of that then was that, first of all, yield is the first thing that's going to dictate your carrying capacity. But the second thing that's going to dictate it is the weight and type of lamb that you have. I suppose we've one year's data on that and we're building on that now again this year and next year again to see to get a hone that into what's a you know a blueprint that we can say to the store lamb producers that you know if you buy this type of lamb at this type of weight, how many days of a crop do you actually need? Or how what sort of a yield of a crop do you need to fit, bring them to a finish off the crop? That ties in well with the work you'd been involved in previously in indoors. We know the more weight we've put on before we start, obviously it's basic, you know, the shorter finish time, the more economical it is, but it's the same outdoors. You have to be realistic then in what you're going to carry on it. Now, I suppose, Frank, some will be going in on these crops later in the year as well. That would have an influence on it. But it'd be interesting yeah. to see year two in it. Look, there are other challenges, like, and I might just get you to allude on some of them, Frank, with those crops in terms of the yield he's achieved. I know you were slightly disappointed with some of them. What were the challenges you faced in year one of it? Yeah, so local care, like Mark is, is coming into the second year of his PhD study. This will be our third year sowing the crops in Atmaria. And we've been through the, we feel like we've been through the full suite of problems at this stage, but I'm sure we'll find more. But I suppose, you know, the big problem is the variation you get in yield and the variation you get in utilisation within crops, but also within years. So to give an example of, of the first year we would have sown, we had a big problem with weeds. You know, you know we were going into plowed up lay ground look at you won't have that same level of weed burden in it where you're going in after a stubble crop but still I suppose that's why we went with the stale seed bed I suppose the other issue down the cropped up and this was particularly last year that when you get a big change in weather your utilisation can drop off very quickly and suddenly you're moving through crop an awful lot quicker so that maybe a, an area of crop that you had budgeted for two or three days suddenly becomes an area that's only getting one day out of it and that's going to affect your overall carrying capacity you know we saw that very clearly last last November when we got a very wet period and we went from having to allocate crop every two days down to every one day and we lost, uh, you know, we lost essentially a third of one experimental plot due to flooding. And that's, so, that's, you know, there are all those sort of challenges crop up with these, when you're grazing these type of crops in the uh, late autumn into the winter. And that's the point I'm just going to tease out with Mark in a moment, but uh, Frank, like, you also had the grass treatment there as well. So you had, I'm mm-hmm. assuming you had similar challenges on it and in terms of finish capacity from it. Oh, exactly. No, we had we have very similar challenges with, with, with the grass treatment in terms of utilisation, in terms of, you know, carrying capacity and having a cover built that you can carry in, in into those winter months. So it's not to say that the, the, the grass wasn't without these problems as well. Just maybe, Frank, I, I just come back one bit of it there with you. Like, you give us clearly what percentage of was finished to these. The need to have a backup plan there or potentially introduce supplementation earlier. Um, I know it's only the initial phase of, but even based on that work, what would your recommendations be? So I suppose our, what we're doing at the minute is, first of all, our lands have a continuous supply to a forage source on the crop. So we have straw in with them. Some people will use silage or use hay. It depends, on, I suppose, on how you're feeding it out and the, the, the group the si- group size that you have. So I suppose once they have that, first of all, that's important from a welfare point of view when they're on the crop to keep room and function right. But then at least they'll be used in taking some sort of forage if you do need to pull them off it. But I suppose the other thing too is to watch how you're getting through that crop. Like when you're allocating a yield in these crops, you'll know when you're coming within a couple of weeks for now a crop. And at that point, it's probably sensible to start introducing some level of concentrate so that the lambs can be adapted onto a, a foraging concentrate diet if needs be, if they're not up to those weights when you do run out of crop. Now, part of Mark's study too is that we're looking at those lambs that don't finish off the crop we're looking at what are the best options for them in terms of is it putting them indoors in an intensive finishing system or what way maybe killing some of them at lighter weights and seeing how they would kill out in terms of what carcass weight we get and how would that affect the economics of the, the overall system Mark I'll, I'll just bring you back to present time a little bit on it like Frank alluded there to the need to move fences and split paddocks maybe on allocations more regularly you were the man on the ground doing some of this how did you just divide up the paddocks like was it twice weekly splits initially? So the allocation clearing was based on a, based on a measurement. So I would have went out. Measurement would have been taken twice a week, uh, cut and weigh method. <clears throat> so then you get your, which allows you to get your dry matter and do your calculation, and it gives you the, how many meters you put up the fence. So at the start of the experiment, we would have been doing two day breaks. So as weather rainfall increased and 
the crop was contaminated by the soil. This meant that we had to cut this back down to a one day break and even less than a one day break, uh, depending, on, depending on weather conditions. So look, in, in bad weather, it's, it's difficult and utilization obviously drops off. You're using three strands of polywire, Mark, or so four strands of polywire or electrified fencing to split this? It's four strands of polywire, yeah, just your normal polywire with um, the poly posts. It's it's working it's it's working good. Uh, it keeps them keeps them on the right side, and um, we find it good. Once you get trained right at the start. Look, just when we we spoke to you about you know difficult grazing conditions, you have a lot of lambs coming in at the moment. I'm assuming they've gone through the usual quarantine process and they'll be at grass. Just in terms of clean livestock, on what steps are you taking to ensure you can draft lambs over cleanly? So as the lambs come in, they're um, they go through the biosecurity protocols, as you've mentioned. Um, at, at the minute, they're out, they're out grazing, so they'll all be brought in next week. Um, so we're just gathering the last few, last few lambs that we need. They'll all be gathered next week, and they'll be sheared going onto the crop. So this minimizes the contamination in the fleece, which is a huge help going into the winter when you come into challenging weather conditions. And you're going full shearing them? A full shear, yeah. They're being full sheared. I suppose okay. the benefit of that too, Karen, is we're going to full shear. And if we do end up there problems later on, dear, we should have sufficient wool growth if we do need to take remedial action later on in the winter. That's true, Frank. You're, you're starting early in time, so there should be a bit back on yeah. them. Frank, yeah. another, another key element of getting ready to go on to these crops is how we acclimatise lambs. So it's a big change over in diet. Um, obviously not for the two grass treatments, but for the other treatments, how did you get over that? Yeah, so look, it is a big challenge, Kieran. Like people often forget that when we're putting them onto these forage crops, fine, it is a forage crop, but it's actually a big change in derumen. So we need to adapt them onto it slowly, no more than if we were introducing lambs to a high level of concentrates. So what we would do is we start them off for an hour or two every day, and over a period of seven to ten days, we build the rams up to full time on the crop. But during that period, they also have a run back onto grass. So we let them onto the crop for a couple of hours, put them back to grass. Stay building that up until at the end of that kind of seven to day, 10 day period, we have them fully adapted and they're on the crop full time. Now, when they're on the crop full time, they'll have access to a, a forage source. So we'll have the straw in the field with them full time at that stage. Our intakes in the straw are very low, but it's still important that we have that there. Some people use silage, some people use hay. It'll depend on, I suppose, ground conditions and how much you're feeding. Um, so basically then when we have them full time, once we're moving them on every couple of days and utilisation ground conditions are good, they will always have a dry lie or a dry lie back. And I suppose one of the challenges, Mark has alluded to how we had to, you know, change our tact a little bit when utilisation dropped and rainfall increased. But part of that is not only for the utilisation crop, but it's also to make sure that the lands have a dry lie under. I know, Frank, I think as you highlighted there, it's very important to get them started off right and probably to pay attention to any of those that maybe there's challenges with. Um, Look, Frank, it's an interesting study. Obviously, it's in its early days yet, and we just got a snapshot of the kind of work you're at, but um, it has a role to play, and it's probably the results of this study over the next couple of years will indicate its full potential. Exactly, exactly. Like We, we, we have relatively little information on what we can do with lambs on these crops, and I suppose lots of people are very interested in it. But it's like anything, until we have a, a concrete set of data that we can show to people exactly what we can produce off and how we can do it efficiently, it's very hard to make an overall comment on it. But I suppose the big thing that we've seen so far is it's certainly not a magic bullet. It does require a lot of intensive management to get the best performance out of it. And it also, before we go buying a big lot of store lambs to put onto it, we need to assess what yield do we have and I suppose how long we intend to graze it and when we intend to start grazing it so that we don't over overgraze it and end up not getting the full benefit out of it, which would be a costly exercise. Look, certainly one will come back to your chef and Mark on again and follow with interest. Frank, thanks very much for your time, Mark. Thanks. Great having you both on. Thank you. Okay, we're going to finish up at this point. It's an interesting project as part of an ongoing series of work that's been conducted on storeland production and it's one we'll certainly try and get back to a later point this year and see how Mark has progressed with those lambs. That's it for me for this episode. Again for any updates on the sheep program. Keep an eye on our Twitter page at Chocolate Sheep. I'm Kieran Lynch. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe and listen in to any of our episodes.